I'm still a good you chendo from the Department of History and International Studies, University of Nigeria, Soka. Hello and welcome to Obehi Podcast. I'm your host, Obehi A14, and I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. I joined the services of UNN in um, October 1998, but I moved to history department in um, February 1999, and uh, my research is quite broad-based. I work on women's issues, I work on um, generally social history, and I engage with a lot of other issues, including um, religious uh, conversions, Islam, historical methodologies and um, his, historiography generally. The first question I would like to ask you just now uh, have to do um, have to do with the background of, of, uh, of Nigerian story. What do you want people to know about our story as a people? That is where we are going to be starting from because later then we are going to be talking of uh, Nigerian story in line with our national identity. Let's start with the story. Please go. What will I want people to know about Nigeria? I think we need to know that Nigeria is a very diverse nation. Nigeria is big by land mass and by population. And um, in this kind of milieu, Nigeria has quite a lot of diversities. There are not less than 500 ethnic groups in Nigeria. I attended a program two, three weeks ago, um, organized by the Nigerian Academy of Letters, and uh, one of the speakers at the scientific session talked about Nigeria being having more than 500 ethnic groups. I'm aware that Nigeria has close to 500, but that's the first time I'm hearing that we have more than 500. So when we have 500 sub-nations that made up the country, we should expect that the range of diversities in the country is quite broad. And um, each of these nations have their languages. Then you come to each language group, you have also dialects. And so the broadness of our diversities is quite huge. We cannot tell the story of Nigeria without talking about how diverse we are. You know, how, But I don't see diversity as a, a weakness. I see it actually as a strength. I see it as a flavoring that makes it uh, impossible for us to get tired with one another. That's the way I look at it. That's very interesting. So earlier today, I was um, interviewing um, someone who is exploring with the National Geographic uh, Washington. And because what they are doing is they try, they try to document um, different history of the pe different people in the world. And I find it very interesting when she was explaining this to me. Uh, in that they try to uh, conserve the uh, the global knowledge, as it were, so that it can be available. More like uh, what Google did, no? Because Google said they wanted to document, they wanted to make the world um, uh, documents or history or knowledge, as it were, accessible to everyone. And they stood by that. They really have been doing a great work on that. Uh, now, looking at that as a pointer, how do we uh, inculcate this diversity that we have in Nigeria into the building of the Nigeria national identity. What's, what place does our diversity play in our identity? A lot. A lot. When you talk about identity, you are talking about how a people want to see themselves. What is unique about them? What are their basic characteristics? What do they want to sell? about themselves to the world. In fact, how do they want to actually understand themselves? We cannot div divorce our diversities from our national identity, whatever we want to make out of it. It is what we are. We can't uh, claim that we are a homogeneous unit, no. We can't say that we speak the same language, no. We have um, what we call a national language, but we have our specific languages, and oftentimes we relate at the 
basis of our specific languages. We believe that everyone has a story to share. We believe in the power of storytelling in today's digital economy. Yes, we believe that our audience need to be touched at the level of emotion so we can better engage. What about you? Do you believe in storytelling as much as we do? Do you want to reach the hearts and minds of your audience? Then join us with our online training class, Storytelling for Content Creators and Digital Entrepreneurs. Come, come to obehi onefoodcom slash storytelling and learn how to leverage your storytelling skills so you can earn more as a content creator and digital entrepreneur. Storytelling is a powerful instrument at our disposal. Let's explore it together. See you in the class. And um, subnationalities. So we have to actually understand our differences. Look at the strengths in it. It's important that whatever we want to craft as our national identity recognizes the core characteristics of all the component units of the nation. So with that now, we must integrate our diversities. Mm -hmm. All right. Th thank you for that. I don't know if maybe uh, Nigerian students uh, there at the university uh, do ask uh, the same question of what is our identity really as a country? What is our national identity? By this time now, we are not talking of people that are only from Edo or whether you are Igbo or whether you are Yoruba. Of course, I know this is also going to play part in it. But something that can be simple for us to understand as our identity as a people, what would that mean? If somebody were to be curious enough to ask such a question. Uh, so our history has gone through a lot of um, stages. The history I studied in secondary school is somewhat different from the history I am living out today or what we know as our history today. You know, the damage we did to ourselves was to remove history from our curriculum. So most of our populations got divorced from their past. There is something I consider when I cons look at the past or when I think about the past. You need to know your past to know your present, to appreciate your present and to project into your future. When we ignore our past or try to obliterate our past or try to hide our past, we are doing an injustice to ourselves. I'm not looking at our national identity from what it seems to be now. At the moment, it's almost like we don't even have any identity, you know? We are so uh, broken up we are so disconnected among ourselves. We don't look at ourselves as a nation. We project our ethnic identities more. And uh, with that frame of mind, we are not accommodating of other ethnic groups. Nigeria is not one ethnic group. It is not all about the Igbo or the Yoruba or the Hausa or the Jo. Nigeria is a nation with 50 sub-nationalities. We came together, whether we were brought together by a stronger power and force, which is Britain, or we became independent and chose to march on together as one nation we have made a decision to stay together. And with that in mind, we should recognize every component unit. I look at Nigeria and I continue to look at Nigeria as a variegated nation. That is a nation with a lot of diversities. But I don't see diversities as a weakness, like I said. It is not a blot in our history. It should actually be what should kind of um, strengthen us, you know, make us appreciate ourselves, make us tolerant of each other, and make us 
uh, give and take in order to work together. So my own concept of our national identity is that we are a really diverse people, united in one nation with one future. Whatever it is we are thinking about the future, these sub-nationalities have a stake and we cannot benefit from it. We should look at our strengths. We all have our strengths and we should build on those strengths and also try to see how we can play down on those things that kind of tend to pull us apart from each other. Um, you said uh, there is going to be uh, a question of give and take at the end of the day. And, and I think that is going to be very important. Um, in that we are going to look for the parts that, are, that project our strength. And we are going to reinforce those lines. Yes, like you said, this is a country that has a lot of diversity. Uh, and those diversity need to be managed, need to be organized. No, it cannot. I understand it's a kaleidoscope of different things. If you take a, take up a piece of art, it's not made of one thing. I did make reference to this when I was writing one of my books relating to the children of Africa that are born in Italy, uh, talking of multiculturality. That you can't pretend that somebody is going to be made of just one thing. People are usually made of different things. But that diversity that is in us, how are we able to maintain our national identity and still have those individuals play a role in it? I, I'll need your help on that. Um, let me draw from history. Nigeria will not be the first heterogeneous um, nation in the world. As far back as uh, the fifth century, we've had heterogeneous nations. We've had the Persian Empire, we've had the Babylonian Empire, we came down to Greece, we came down to the Roman Empire before the colonial experience. I mean, these were uh, several centuries ago. What helped the heterogeneous nations to survive? I was looking at the history of the Persian Empire, let's say, about a month or more ago, and I discovered something interesting. The Persian Empire of those days encompassed so many nations. Pakistan was there, Turkey was there, several other nations were there. But their emperors recognized the diversities of these nations, what did they do? They tried to, to allow you know, the specific cultural traits of these nations to be retained. So we, they had their regions. They organized themselves in such a way that all these sub-nations were recognized, were carried along. It was then they started... Um, introducing things like the postal services, Darius that took over from uh, Cyrus II did so. You know, they brought up structures that helped them to better manage these diverse sub-nations. We also can learn from that. Nigeria just has to recognize that it is a heterogeneous nation. It's another way of talking about a diverse nation, you know, a nation that has a lot of diversities. It's a heterogeneous nation. And being a heterogeneous nation, it has to play down certain things. It shouldn't promote one ethnic group over and above the other. We shouldn't arrogate more importance to one group against the other. When we are making laws, it should cut across the entire nation. Divisive things should not be allowed to have the right of them, uh, to have a serious dominance so that it does not tear the country apart. If we want to remain as a nation, we must set up structures to manage our diversities, to better handle our heterogeneous nation. We cannot come promote one religion over and above others. We are thinking that we have three major religions in the country, 
Christianity, Islam, African traditional religion. But as a historian and somebody who teaches religions in West Africa, I can tell you that there are myriads of religions being practiced in Nigeria. You know, we just have to release the control of certain sectors and not insist that everybody must be a Muslim, everybody must be a Christian, everybody must be a traditionalist, and so on and so forth. These things divide instead of building. We can emphasize the beauty in our cultures. You come to Igbo land, you know, their cultures, what we like about them, you pick those. You can, we, can, we can promote certain things. We can market certain attributes of our cultures. Either our cuisine, our arts, and all whatnot. You know, all these things are things to sell us. They are things to give us, to, to bring about a blending of all the entities that make up the country. And in doing that, we are carrying our diversities along in a positive way. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, I think uh, this is where uh, history is important. Because if we understand very well now our history, uh, by our history, I'm not talking of only Nigerian history in this sense, because uh, we as Nigerians, we are not the only people in this world. We are cohabiting with other people in this world. And it is not compulsory that we must only live by our experience. We can also live through the experiences of others. That is why we are collective human beings. In that we can look at other people, maybe for example, like the Malia Empire. It was said to be bigger than the whole of Western Europe put together. It was not a, it was not one group of people. There were a lot of different group of people that make up the Malia Empire. So what I'm trying to say about that, even after before Malia Empire, the Egyptians, many dynasties in the time of Egypt was not just one group of people. It was different group of people that are coming together to organize their society. What I actually mean by this is that uh, Nigerians need to say the truth to themselves that for the fact that we are diverse should not be the reason why we should be having a problem. Because we are believing with diversity from day one. It is, not, it is nothing new to us. It is only a question of managing it. Just because it is diverse does it mean ah okay that is a block there we cannot cross it no it means we should be mature enough to take the problem and manage it in fact it's not even a problem it's a resources we must take the resources and explore it and explore it again and again to our advantage that is what i think we should do and again this has to do with history do we know where we are coming from do we know how we have been interacting before. Because if we remove history now, we appear like children. We don't even know where we are coming from. So we cannot forge anything as we are standing. And that becomes a very big detriment to the future. Now, you said that history was removed in our curriculum, which is something that we talked about before. The other time, I was also talking about it with a professor at um, Ibadan University. The question I was asking him is what I'm going to ask you again. What was the justification to remove history to make it that it become reasonable that Nigeria shouldn't know about themselves? I still cannot understand it. It makes me laugh. I don't think um, I don't think there is any serious justification for that. I know that the government at the time became fixated with science and technology. They wanted to promote science and technology and they felt that they will do so, they will do better in that trajectory by playing down on some arts and uh, non-science subjects. And history took the blow. It was quite um, a very serious um, political matter because Within the non-sciences too, there were competitions, subject areas competing against the others. History was just unfortunate, I'll put it that way. History was just unfortunate to be taken off the curriculum. 
If somebody did it intentionally, it is very sad. We'll not be the first country actually to go through that process. Many, a number of countries have at one time or the other tried to play down on, on history. And a number of countries had at one time or the other tried to disadvantage the non-science um, subjects. I remember at a time in the US when that also happened. And when Obama came up, President Obama came up, he made a case for the liberal arts. I still recall one of the um, lectures he gave on that wise. So I personally do not buy any reason that would have cost our leaders at that time to remove history from the curriculum. Let me tell you a more recent thing that happened. Ted Fund is a national organization sponsoring um, education at the tertiary level. Sometime last year, Ted Fund decided to ask several of the non-science subjects again in sponsoring PhD students from tertiary institutions to study abroad or locally for their PhDs. They removed courses that uh, we are in the non-sciences, you know, that's still a matter of um, discussion. And what could that be? There was no reason given for it. It's a very current thing. It, I think we, we began to say it between December and the, either January or so. What could be the reason for that kind of um, an action? You know, we don't know yet. So it starts just like that. Nobody knows who behind is calling these shots who is uh, releasing this information or giving these directives. We just see these things happen. And before we correct them, it takes a long time, by which time so much damage has been done. Let me say something. You, you, you said, how we are we living? Has somebody tried to find out how we are living before we became a nation? I can tell you, yes, I have tried to find out. I tried to look at um, the different sections of the country, how they live together. And I found it so fascinating that in the southeastern axis, that is the area below the rivers Niger and Benue, you know, even crossing to parts of um, the southwest, where you have the Benin Empire, beyond, and so on. We live together. We recognize that we are independent nation, so to say, but we collaborated on the platform of trade. Trade brought people together. Just as it brought them together, it led to a lot of cohesion. There were intermarriages, there were mixings, there were transference of cultures among the groups. In the course of discussing the way we lived before, how that we actually collaborated among ourselves between the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, down to the 19th century, before colonialism took over. One of the older professors, uh, Professor Emeritus, told me something, that the influence did not even went beyond what I taught, that as far as the Edo are concerned and the Urobo Ishekiri, that they even have Igbo blood showing the interconnections between these groups. One of the early missionaries that came here, either, I think it was Talbot. Talbot gave a report that fascinated me. Talbot had studied the religious patterns of um, the Igbo, the Efik, the Ibibio, the Calabari, the Ijo, and uh, the Nembe, and those groups. And he came up with this um, conclusion that their religious patterns were the same, only that the names they used were just dialectically defined, but the same structure, showing a much longer mixing between these people. We were not fighting, uh, but even if we fought among ourselves, which was inevitable because of a trade interest or other interests, they still made up and they still continued. They had these ties together. 
before colonialism came up, before Britain interjected, interfered with their peace, and came up with a new structure that they tried to force everybody under, still they collaborated. The Aba Women's War of 1929 was a collaboration among the women of southeastern Nigeria to resist colonialism. It was not something that was done by the Igbo alone. It extended as far as those in the Ijo area, showing a kind of cohesion despite, uh, will I say, their specific ethnic identities. They have been working together and they still work together. I also discovered that further afield, even in northern Nigeria, it was not only the house that we are there, it was not only the Fulani that we are there, there were so many ethnic groups there. They collaborated among themselves. When they had, the, when they had issues, they fought it out and they still made their peace. You know, they, every group, there were that given and taking mixtures, transference of cultures, as far back as those centuries. We were living better in those centuries than even now that we are a nation. If we had known our history, if we had known that this was how we lived in the past, it would have helped us to continue to forge together in building our collective unity, our sense of belonging within the geographical boundaries that we call Nigeria. And what I'm saying is not only limited to either the southeast or the north. I discovered the same with those in the, uh, what do you call it, the, what we used to call the middle belt, that is not central Nigeria. In fact, from there, the researches I did yielded that they had similar burial cultures and a lot of other things that, that tied them together, even though they were not one homogeneous ethnic group. So they have been collaborating among themselves. And these cultural unities con have continued and survived till today. They're still practicing what they were doing many years ago. Somebody that wrote about uh, the confluence area said something. How that within the confluence, you had all the ethnic groups in Nigeria represented. People migrated to the confluence areas sometime in the 18th, 19th centuries. And there, they pulled themselves together. They had common masquerade um, um, culture. They also had um, common divination culture. The same pattern of divination used by the Yoruba, used by the Igbo, used by the Igala and the Doma. You know, these things were before colonialism was established and entrenched. And they have survived even colonialism. But because we don't know our history, we don't even know that our unities, our collaborations date several centuries back. These are things we need to resuscitate with history, with the help of history, so that we can forge a more unified national identity. Thank you so much for that, Professor. <laughs> you see, um, this is very important, the conversation that we're having just now, the conversation on history. Uh, because you also talked about uh, spirituality. I've uh, done a lot of interview related to this area, history, our languages, our spirituality, because they, they are the ones that actually explain who we are. That is why I find it very strange that somewhere some intelligent people in Nigeria decided that there was no need to study history anymore. I don't know what they were thinking. I don't know what they were drinking. Anyway, um, that is something very important that the one that you were mentioning because this has also been confirmed by other scholars that not only within the Nigeria as is now, but all across Africa, that the Africa, in fact, that is an interview that I did recently where uh, the professor was saying that all African languages, sorry, all African religion is one. They, are, they have the same similarity all across from Congo to Egypt to Kemi to uh, Ghana to Igbo. Because you enter it also from the language, the meaning, the significance, then you enter it to the practice, then you enter to the refiguration. It is, all, it is something that we need to try and understand. Because you, you did say something before that maybe people uh, make, I don't know whether actually they make mistake by removing history, but I don't think it's a mistake. I think it's a deliberate attempt to root us out of our history. And by rooting us out of our history, we are standing on the sand. And when you are standing on the sand, you can fall any time because you don't have root. Because history tells you where you are coming from. 
And if you know where you are coming from, even though today might be challenging, today might be difficult, because you are able to recollect where you are coming from, you will always be able to find your way. You will always be able to find your way. It's only a question of time. But if you don't know where you are coming from, when you are confused, you are lost. Because where are you going to go? You don't have anywhere to go. So history, I think, is the number one that must be taught in every part of the world. People must know where they are coming from, who they are. In re- and particularly as us, Africans, who believe that our life are not just individual. We are living in, in, in a relationship with other people and also other things, the nature where we live. That should be a big crime to remove history. Anyway, I want to ask again. We're going back to be able to, uh, uh, to forge our identity because you, you did say also that in Nigeria, we don't, our identity is very watery. It's not defined. We don't know who we are. Where, how far should we go back to be able to forge our identity as Nigeria? I don't even want to care whether this was done by the British to men just together 1914 before then and after then then we, we, we eventually got independent it's not it's all of this can be irrelevant we now are a people we are living as a country the problem and the blessings of nigeria we have inherited it and as a people we can fix it but how far can we go back to recollect so we can fix the nigeria identity problem i think it's as far as we have the records for the southeast, the axis I, talked, I, I referred to as the southeast, the earliest records we have dates from the 1400s, that is documented data, dates from the 1400s. If archaeology can push the date further back, that's okay. I know that uh, some people who have looked at the Ibopu culture, talk about a ninth century event. If they have proofs of this, and it gives us a clue as to how we have lived together in the past, we can use that. It's as far as we have the data to use to begin to build. We should begin to build from that point. In the North, it is different. Islam gave them a system of um, documentation that dates back to the 12th century, earlier. To be a great content creator in today's fast-changing economy, you need one thing, storytelling. Storytelling is a powerful instrument to leverage, either for personal use or for your business success. This is why this training class, Storytelling for Content Creator and Digital Entrepreneurs, was created. It is designed to help you leverage the power of storytelling so you can stand out from the crowd and earn more in your business. Come to obehiairwanfo.com slash storytelling and learn how to leverage your storytelling skill to earn more as a content creator and digital entrepreneur. You need the power of storytelling to stand out in the competition. So let's explore it together. See you in the class. In fact, you even have records dating back to the 10th century when you look at the Amoravid conquest that came through Ghana and eventually ended up in Kano and so on. So as far back as they can pull from their own um, documented um, data, they can use that to begin to build this identity that we want to build to begin to build a national, and I don't mean, when I talk about a national history, please, I don't mean a history that is carefully doctored. I don't want a doctored history because that also can do harm. Let us tell our story the way it is. We have different stories to tell. All those narratives are important. Let us bring them all together and use them to build, to project what we want of our nation. What we need to emphasize is that our unity did not start with colonialism. That is my point. We have been uniting as independent nations before colonialism came 
interrupted the process, reconfigured us. We should not forget the past, the pre-colonial period. As far back as we have the records of our mixing up, our coming together, our forging together, we should use it to strengthen our unity in this space we call Nigeria. All right, thank you for that. Now, uh, we are touching also an area that is uh, important for us, which is the documentation. And now, uh, this is my question, maybe it might be provoking. Um, is it true that we really do not have documentation of the past, or we are just lacking the cultural intelligence and the ability to interpret those cultural artifacts? Because now, it would take, I think, the, a Dutchman to dig up central Nigeria to find the non culture. <laughs> the other day, I was talking to somebody about the non culture, and this person was um, in Jaws, and he was asking me, What do you mean by that? He was an academia. I said, Non culture, central Nigeria. You don't know what that means? So, are we really lacking this documentation? Does it mean they are not really there? Or we just haven't worked enough to look at, even when we have them in front of us, to interpret them. What about the royal palaces? Don't they have documentation of the people that have been coming before them? I know, for example, I am coming from Urumi. I know the first king that stayed in Urumi. Of course, I am not saying every Urumi person knows this. From the first to the present one. Of course, we don't have accurate documentation of everything that has been happening. This is because we have not worked enough to tell this story. Perhaps we are waiting that somebody is coming to tell the story for us. So in those palaces all across the country, can they tell us what has been happening? Can't we document it in a way that it can be available for us to study? Because if we don't do it now, another generation is going to come and ask the same question. What are the documentation? Another generation is going to come again and ask, what are the documentation? Do we really lack the documentation or we are lacking the ability to interpret them? Do we lack the documentation or the ability to interpret them? Let me start by saying that with respect to documentation, we do have challenges. But I think that the greater challenge is that we are not doing anything about it. Um, for the past six months, the universities have been on strike. At least the major universities have been. <laughs> And good one, Nigeria, good Nigeria. <laughs> we are very and good. Why is strike? <laughs> you know, it's a problem of funding. It's not even funding in the way I look at funding. The nations that have documentation invested in it, they brought out money to make it possible. But Nigeria has not understood why it is important for education to thrive. So they're not bringing money for research the way they should. What they're doing is at the level of what we call tokenism, which doesn't actually do much. By the time they tell you how much is needed to do a work and do it well, you'll be surprised. A friend of mine, a colleague of mine in Leipzig, at the University of Leipzig in Germany, with a few other colleagues, got a grant of 6 million euro. That was um, 2019. And they're doing a study that is very fascinating a study that is cutting across different nations in Africa. But what are they even investigating? They're investigating labor, how labor is sourced, what happens in that sector, and they're making comparisons to understand the variegated nature of this concept. Six million euros. Just um, last week or two weeks ago, yes, we met at the National Archives in Ogo and he was sharing the reports of their findings so far with me. They needed money for this. And 
the European Union with the government of Germany came together and made that money available. I have not heard that Nigerian government released, <laughs> what will I even say? <laughs> one million, <laughs> one million dollars for research. <laughs> you know, you are talking about the foreigner that is coming to dig no culture. You know how many diggers you are going to employ? And if you want them to do this work and to do it satisfactorily, you should give them something that will motivate them. The money is not really for the researcher to eat. The, the researcher needs people to work with, people to make things happen. So we are not bringing the money that should make these studies relevant. That is the important thing. It's not just that uh, there's no documentation, but can we recreate them? My meager salary of 580-something dollars a month, that was the last salary I was paid as a professor of uh, almost 10 years, the last salary in um, February this year, translates to 580-something dollars. Is that not shameful? Really? How can I use that to do the kind of study you are talking about? Has it fed me? Has it taken care of my basic needs? You imagine how we try to even get lighting for this little uh, discussion, you know? So if we want to do this, which we can do, the government has to bring out the resources for it. When they cannot pay, Pay, pay their lecturers. It was in, a, I remember very well, it was in the 1990s that Obasanjo came with the current minimum wage that we are using. No increase. And in the last seven years, the economy has so deteriorated that our money was became useless. Still, the government is not seeing any need to change the rhetoric, to change the narrative of tertiary education and research in this country. So that's a danger. That's where Thank I look at the major problem with reconstructing our history. Thank you so much for that sharing. That is, that is very important. And it's, it clarify the part that the document, the artifacts actually are there. Because there is a misconception that we want our ancestors to have documented it maybe in English or in French. That is not how they did it. They probably didn't write the letter that we are writing today. It is up to us to interpret what they were writing because they wrote it differently. So it is up to us to take up an artifact that was made, I don't know, uh, 500, 600 years ago and say, okay, this is what it means. We cannot give this job to other people to do, though. For God's sake, this is our job. We are going to look for a way to do this job. Because the history that people say often that is not documented in Africa, is a, which is a lie, is actually there. Sometimes they are buried beneath our feet. Sometimes they are just there looking at us in front, and we are very busy because the way uh, Nigeria, of course, the whole of Africa is organized, is that they have weaponized poverty, they have weaponized knowledge, and because you are strongly to be alive, you, who cares about history? You are struggling to be alive. But that is part of the design too. So that you don't need to care about what should you do. You are about to die of hunger. So why should you care about finding out what happened 2,000 years ago? Are you stupid? That is the design. All right. Thank you so much for that. But at least for the benefit of those that are listening to us, all this history about Africa and Nigeria, they are there. But our government are too intelligent. They don't, they don't think it is important to know about our history. So they are not investing in it. That is why they, their heart is now aching that their students are at home for six months. What is your plan? What is the emergency to help them recover from that? How are they going to recover after six months of no study? That, that is to tell you the kind of government that we are talking about here. Just for the purpose of uh, argumentation, Say maybe, for example, we were to go to, uh, say maybe, for example, the Benin Palace. Say, 
tell us about because you know you know one thing that is really very important is that there are a lot of historians that are there that can actually tell most of the story the one that they know now what i think maybe we should do as researchers as people that are studying history people that are try to document it, is to talk to a lot of them and we put it together and make sense out of it. Because again, we're not expecting them to write it in English because that is not the language they documented it. But say for maybe somebody wants to understand this story, where should they go? In the palace, in the traditional home? Where are these documents available so for somebody to review? Documents are everywhere. Everywhere. Thank you for that. They're in our palaces, actually. You know, they are, there's no way you will not get the documents. They're also in the brains of people. We need to tap them. Like you said, we need to collect them and interpret them. I can tell you that even our traditional rulers are not making things easy. Everybody in Nigeria is trying to survive, trying to put food in his or her stomach. So sometimes you go to these traditional rulers. I'm reporting an incident that happened lately, actually two months ago. I'm using that as an example. You go to the traditional rulers and they're asking you to pay for this to happen, for that to happen, to settle them, you know, things like that. Sometimes, yes, sometimes what they're expecting, they, you know, they have this concept, after all, you're going to use it for your welfare. You are, they are looking at the short-term gains, so to say, to the researcher, that this researcher, you're going to get promoted after doing this work, so therefore you pay to get it. But they are not considering the long-term impact, the long-term benefits, which they themselves will also derive from when the researcher has done that work. So I had this um, case in 2000, and, uh, sorry, uh, in June, June, when a colleague went to a community not so far from Nsoka for research. And... Um, they were talking about issues of money that was so embarrassing. I told the spokesperson of uh, the traditional ruler, I said, please don't let this person leave your palace with a bad impression. I said, it's not going to be in your best interest. It shouldn't be. I still recall an incident that happened when I was working on my PhD in the 1990s. This happened in Asaba. And I met a female chief. You see, the obstacles this lady put on my way were so demoralizing, so demoralizing that even the two chiefs that accompanied me, I had to bring two chiefs before I could be granted interview. One from east of the Niger, another from west of the Niger, a list of things I should present, wine and the way or what not. Why? Because I was going to see a titled person. I did this. I went to Oka to borrow a chief. I went to another community to borrow a chief. Of course, I had to pay for their transport. This was happening in the 1990s. I had to bring the wine and everything. And we went together. Do you know that I was still not granted that interview? Why? That I was too small for to to be told the history of the people. I was too young. I've not forgotten <laughs> that experience. The data we need are everywhere, but the temporary custodians, because that's what I call them, these are temporary custodians. To make these available becomes a problem. They they want to catch in on it and see what they can siphon out of it without looking at the bigger picture, you know, without looking at the benefits that they and their posterity will derive, not to mention the national good, you know, that will come from it in the long term. Thank you for that. That is important. And it is important to, to be said that uh, the the obstacle, but first of all, we have established something that actually all these documentation they are available. 
but sometimes they don't make it available for people to uh, to see. And sometimes on our part, of course, not all of us, we are not strongly enough to be able to find this documentation. No? But I want to believe now, if CNN has come, they will allow them to see those documentation. I want to believe that. That if BBC has sent journalists, uh, they will say, they won't even ask for money. Hey, come, come and see, you know. But we are talking of us now reviewing our own history for goodness sake. This history, most of them should be available to the public because it is public history. It's the history of the people. Because out there, they are saying we don't have any evidence of us ever living that will probably jump down from the sky. And that is somebody that have access to those information to say that, no, we have been here all this while. So they want you to first of all pay them before they can tell you. Or they will say you are not qualified at all. You are not. It's, not, it's, it's discouraging. Really, it's discouraging. But we don't need to be discouraged. We need to tell this story because this is our story. It tells the world who we are and where we are coming from. They are essential. It's an existential important for us. All right, now, for the sake of our national identity, building who we are as a country, and we looking back into our history, what should we be looking for? And what should we be find, trying to find out from our history so that we can build upon that to build the Nigerian national identity? I will say two things. Personally, I am interested in our commonalities. When I look at the past, I look at our commonalities. I look at the things that unite us. I try to also do not, it's, to me it's not so important, but I say try to look at where the divisive um, tendencies are, what has actually caused trouble among us so that we know how to manage our differences better. Our commonalities for me is primary, is very, very primary. It's going to strengthen our unity today when we know that we have a history of commonalities that dates back several centuries before. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, talking of this national identity that should be, and um, we will build it, what should constitute it in your view? What should constitute the Nigerian national identity? Okay. No, in the national identity, you know, should in talking about the national identity we are talking about how we want to see ourselves and market ourselves so why do i think that should constitute it us what is unique about us what is unique about the different entities in nigeria it should be there what we are the people that lay the foundation for this nation this story should be there. We already have aspects of this, like our heroes. You know, there's no sub-nation that does not have its list of heroes and heroines. We still talk about the Amina of Zaria. We still talk about Judge of Opobo, who fought for his people, resisted um, colonialism. Those, we, those things should constitute our national identity. We should also talk about the stages we have come over the centuries to become Nigeria. Even the amalgamation is an aspect of our identity because it was at that point that we came together. Whatever may be the basis, yes, it was something that was done for economic reasons to benefit a certain um, protectorate. But like you said, it has brought us together. We can still stand on that pedestal to project better. Britain may have its reasons for the amalgamation, but we can create our own reason for it. Why? When we had to become independent, we did not look at what Britain did or British ideology. We considered the desire to be together as a nation. And that was why in 1957, when the other regions were ready and the North was not ready, the other regions chose to wait for the North, meaning that our nationalists of those days had accepted our coming together. They were giving credence 
to that amalgamation that occurred a few decades earlier, three to four decades earlier. They are building on it with a new vision of a new Nigeria that should be united, you know, uh, for a glorious future. So these things are stages in our progress as a nation. They should be in whatever we are crafting as our national identity. We cannot play them down. No, we cannot. We cannot ignore them. What others ascribe to them should not be what we should ascribe to them. We should ascribe to them things that are relevant to us and what we want to achieve in our journey as a nation and build on that. Yeah, I subscribe to that. that yeah, it is true that the British might have done this based on their interests, based on their whatever it is it that they wanted. But here we are today. This is 2022. Moving from here off, upward, we can decide our own destiny. We are men and women who are capable of deciding our own destiny. So the choice is us. In fact, it has never been that of other people. It has always been our, just that we haven't yet realized that we are able to decide our own destiny. And we will want to be called what we want to be called. It is up to us. So this building of our national identity would, of course, encompasses a lot of things, no? We just talk about our history. We need to be explored for our own good. It's for our own good our history needs to be explored, not for the good of other people. Our national identity should reflect who we are. You thought of uh, the multifaceted Nigeria, no? We, we have diversity, which of course needs to be interpreted and absolutely very positive. A good example would be taking up a work of art. It's made of different color. If it is, if you take up uh, a white paper and you write with white pen, it would not make sense because you cannot see it. It starts with contradiction. So we must be able to accept it that this is the way it is. The human body is made up of different parts. It is not only one eyes. The eyes is very useful, but so is the nose too. What about the mouth? They are not doing the same function, but all of them are important. I think Nigeria, building on this as a diverse country, we must understand that one part of Nigeria is the eyes. It's not the most important, but it is important. Another part is the ear. We can't say, let's cut off the ear because I'm um, the eyes. No, you cannot do that. All of it is important. We are Nigerian. We are diverse. Yes, but we are important. If you don't believe me, then go home, take a knife and cut off your nose because it is nose. Eh? So that you can have the eyes because it is eyes. We need all of it. All of it, we need it. But the question is this. Who is going to do this? Who is going to build this identity? Who is going to reinforce this line that it is important? Because they are not actually new things. Because this is what history is telling us now. Thanks also to you. That we have been living together before now. It didn't start just with the colonialists. We have been doing this before now, long, several hundreds of years ago, before the British came. But who is going to tell this history to the people? Because many people don't know. Yeah, we have to tell the story. I will tell the story. And I've actually started telling the story in um, one of my books. That's um, Islam in um, the Niger Delta, published in 2018, a book that also won an international award. I talked about the unity of the South East between the Igbo, Idoma, sorry, not Idoma, the Igbo, Ibibio, Anang, Efig, Ijo, and uh, the other coastal um, ethnic groups along uh, the Atlantic Ocean. I looked at our commonalities and I presented it in that um, book. I talk about it in the classroom. I've talked about it today too. I believe that it is our responsibility as um, historians to emphasize these things. We should not join others in um, talking carelessly about our history. We should promote it. Nobody will do it for us. We will have to do it. 
when the government catches sun on it, the government can also run programs on the television, you know, to also buttress these points. They used to do that during um, the tenure of uh, Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida when they came up with Mamsa, came up with all this national orientation and stuff like, you know. That time they tried to put some information across to Nigerians. The government can still do that, but while they were waiting for the government to wake up to its responsibility, those of us who know should keep telling the story, should keep teaching our students, seeing opportunities and using opportunities to discuss these issues so that our constituency, at least, is familiarized with some of these aspects of our history and our projections as a nation. Thank you for that. That is very important. I just wanted to, to ask again, uh, how you see the role of the, you know, now we have a lot of influencers, no, uh, in, our, in our current uh, medias, no, people who have millions of people that are following them, either as artists or as um, a musical artist or movie. We also have uh, Nollywood, which have become very powerful. So to this individual who have a lot of influence in the society today, what do you want to tell them in terms of this telling of our national history? Because it is up to us now. Nobody is coming from anywhere to do this job. We are going to do it. So what do you have to say to them? What I will tell everybody is use whatever platform is available to you to project our national identity correctly, positively, constructively. I stopped watching Nollywood several years ago, and I have a reason. Nollywood does not project the Nigerian image correctly. Sometimes I wonder where they borrow the ideas for some of their films because they actually disconnected from the real lived experiences of Nigerians. If you had observed, it got to a point they were projecting some things that were not really the way we lead. You know, they were so off, off the radar, as far as I'm concerned. And um, I felt that their themes at the time were not edifying. Let's say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, yeah, getting to uh, 20 years ago, to me, their films were not really edifying. When they started, they started well. Maybe that they, they did one film and it gave them money, everybody jumped into it, and all you see are uh, projections of witches and wizards everywhere, um, ritual killings and murders everywhere. How has that helped us? And I keep wondering, where really do we situate this in our history? What text did they read that gave them the same um, ideas? When people are crafting films, they should be able to study the subject matter very, very well to ensure that what they're going to project it's as close to the lived experiences of the people as possible. What I'm saying to Nollywood, I want to believe that they, are, they have started repenting. They should repent more in this direction. They should project the Nigerian story correctly. Who knows if it is not them that uh, gave a Philip to all these kidnappings that are everywhere. Because they kept showing such things. Money, um, what do you call it now? money rituals and stuff like that for quite a while. Now we have Yahoo Yahoo. Vices are rising, you know. So <laughs> please, <laughs> all, <laughs> all our artists, all our performers should tell stories that edify. And they shouldn't lie, but they should tell stories that will build morals. Do you know that telling a story is one of the most powerful ways to connect with your audience? Do you know that the human brain processes story much more easily and quickly than facts and figure? Stories are a great way to engage your audience, get them interested in your products and services, and inspire them to take action. A good story will help you create more compelling content 
that can be shared on social media or through other channels. And it's not just about telling a compelling story, it's also about knowing how to tell it effectively. Now, do you want to better connect with your audience? Then join us on our online training class, Storytelling for Content Creators and Digital Entrepreneurs. Come to obehim slash storytelling and learn how to leverage your storytelling skill to earn more as a content creator and digital entrepreneur. Storytelling is a powerful way to connect with your audience, so let's explore it together. See you in the class. That we strengthen the our concept of good or rightness and wrongness. Not mm -hmm. confuse the people that we buy into a culture that is actually alien to us. We all have a stake in building our national identity. Nollywood actually is a very powerful instrument that could have been used by the uh, government of Nigeria if they wanted to to use it as a way of narrating the Nigerian story, if they wanted to. Just like, for example, uh, the United States uses ho uh, Hollywood. They pay a lot of money there, but the story is well orchestrated. They know what they want to tell in the story. And they put a lot of money there, and it works. It works. But it appears that in Nigeria, for example, uh, we don't care. They, there is no... Nobody care what you do. Just go and make money, uh, make movie to make money. Yes, you can do that. But what if, what if this is actually a powerful instrument that somebody can use to tell the national story? For example, to use it to review the Nigerian Civil War, for example, to really tell the story in a way that this story can be kept in the National Archive as a re -re replica of the story. What if this one can be used to look back in the, in the days? Because now, like you said, everybody is looking at witches and wizards. And we think that uh, you have no impact. You have a lot of impact. We talk of, we show a lot of film where people are kidnapping others, see how they pay them money. Because very soon, because what happened is that the masses do not really have the competence to be able to analyze. They just consume information. That is why there need to be control sometimes on the kind of information you share with the people. Because people don't, they don't, evaluate in most of the cases sorry to just put it like that so somebody need to take responsibility for the kind of information they give out there to the people now another thing i also uh, think there is that we talk about going back in the history do you sometimes also talk about the origin of this certain group of people when you are doing your research like where are they coming from yeah we we, we look at them you can't talk about a people without talking about where they came from that's also another area that people have researched on. I would say that the older professors of the 60s and 70s did a lot of work in that area. I give credence to a particular historian, Professor Elizabeth Isiche. She did so much in collecting uh, histories of um, origins of many ethnic groups in Igbo land and beyond in the Niger, no, 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 in the Middle Belt, um, Plateau Axis, and so on. Um, Professor Adiele Afibo did the same also for Igbo land. Uh, Professor Tamono and um, several of them have done this. So we already have something in that wise to work with. I don't think that anybody going to look at this aspect of our history is reasonably going to bring up something new. It may be to reinterpret, to critically evaluate, to cross-check data, and to see if there's something else. But we have something in this axis that is already a stepping stone we can stand upon to continue to work. It might appear that we are just talking about Nigeria, but it's not only Nigeria that is actually concerned here. Because this podcast is dedicated, a lot of, most of our audience are actually African the diaspora. What we say here also concerns them, because when we are talking about the history of origin just now, where are the people coming from, 
Uh, it makes sense to them because many of them were uh, ripped off from Africa as uh, and enslaved. So many of them do not know exactly where they are coming from, but they have some semblance of maybe here or there. And by the time we show them this story, it makes sense to them too. So it's not, it doesn't end in Nigeria. It has a, a wide reach at the end of the day. Looking at the Nigeria identity, looking at the conversation that we have had today, I want you to make your final thought on it as to what people should go away with in this conversation, because that is important for us now. Yeah, my final uh, comment will be that Nigeria is blessed with a lot of diversities. You can't get tired of Nigeria. The ethnic groups all have something to offer. Uh, we have so much to learn from each other. We have our strengths that we can pull together to build a formidable nation. Our diversity extends to even our economic uh, peculiarities. There is, we, can, we have so much to actually make us a very rich and formidable nation. We need to look at these things. We need to understand that it is a blessing to have these diversities than to be monolithic. That's super. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and the conversation. Thank you. But I have one more thing to say. Please, please go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> now, what I want to say is I want to invite everybody to a conference that my research group and research organization is putting together. It is on navigating the archives. Earlier, we talked about where the data is, where are these resources, where are these documentations. One of them is the archives. People have gathered data together over the decades, starting from the colonial period from the 1900s down to 1960. We want to evaluate how we can use this data. How accessible are they to researchers? Researchers are having issues of um, assessing using. The managers are also having issues of really managing the documents that have been put in their hands. This conference is slated to hold in February next year from 20th to 23rd. It is online. Anybody that is interested can check it out on ahrudc.academy. And we want Nigerians to key in. Let us debate how we can start this documentation process of our history with the mind of building the national identity we want for our nation. Thank you so much. That is a valid information. So for most of you there, check it out. This is a call. You know, this is a job that we have to do. If you are in Nigeria, your job is to make sure that this conversation does not die. Because it is not enough to blame other people now. This is you. This is about you. Because you are in Nigeria. Remember that one day, if you are a young person now, you will also grow old. People are going to ask you, what did you do? You cannot simply blame everything on other people. So everybody has a stake in it. Let each and every one of us ask, what can I do to make Nigeria better than I found it? It is your job. It is, my own job is to make sure my Nigeria is better. You also make sure your Nigeria is better so that Nigeria can eventually become better for all of us. Thank you so much, Professor. I appreciate the time. It's a pleasure. I enjoyed the conversation. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Obehead Podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehead everyone for Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.